Welcome, everyone, and thank you again for attending today's webinar, Better Design Through Measurement, Contact versus Non-Contact Technologies, brought to you by Faro and Design World Magazine. We would like to thank our presenter, Ryan Dent of Faro, for being here today. I'm Leslie Langnaw, and I'll be your moderator. Just a couple of housekeeping details before we begin the webinar. If you wish to tweet about this webinar anytime during or after, you can use the hashtag DWWebinar, and we will have a question and answer session after the presentation. But you can go ahead and submit your questions onto uh, the screen that you'll see on the side there where it says questions, and we will ask them after Ryan has finished his presentation. Now, a brief introduction about Ryan. Ryan works as an application engineer for Ferro Technologies, and he has been with the company since last September. He works with customers in many industries to resolve measurement and quality assurance challenges. He also attended the University of Illinois and has a bachelor's degree in aerospace engineering with a focus in aeronautical analysis and design. So without further ado, I'm going to turn over the presentation to Ryan. So thank you, Ryan. Oh, thank you, Leslie. Um, yeah, first off, I'd like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, as Leslie mentioned, my name is Ryan Dan. Uh, I am an application engineer with Fair Technologies. And today's webinar is going to be an analysis of different contact and non-contact measurement solutions. And then finally, a comparison of the two, kind of comparing industry-based, which works better where. Um, so we'll go ahead and start and, uh, with the agenda today. Um, and so for our presentation then, we're going to go ahead and we go. We're going to go ahead and have uh, one second. Sorry about that. We're going to have an introduction. Um, I want to introduce the concepts of uh, contact and then non-contact um, solutions. So you know, what are they uh, for people who are unfamiliar? And then I want to go over real quickly uh, single point repeatability, or as it's also known, precision, and uh, volumetric accuracy. Because a lot of machines are spec using these two numbers, and I want people to know really what the difference between those two numbers is. Um, after that, we're going to go ahead and jump right into the different types of contact measurements. Um, there are a, a variety, so we're going to go over uh, the different types, as well as some, uh, some challenges associated with each of them and some benefits as well. Um, after we cover the contact measurement section, uh, we're going to jump right into non-contact measurement solutions. Um, and for this presentation, um, because it's a comparison, we're mostly going to stick to um, those non-contacts that apply to articulated arm coordinate measuring machine. Finally then, we're going to have that industry-based comparison I mentioned, how can you benefit? And then um, as, as was uh, covered earlier, there will be a question and answer session after the presentation. All right, so then we'll go ahead and uh, get into the introduction. So what is contact measurement? Well, with an articulated arm coordinate measuring machine, as I have abbreviated here on the screen, uh, CMM, um, Basically, a contact measurement is any type of probe that requires direct contact with a surface. So it needs to be physically touching the part that you want to record in. Um, now, there are a couple different types that we're going to be covering today. Um, and that's going to include hard probes and touch trigger probes. So the big difference is it needs to be physically touching the part. All right, so now, what is non-contact measurement? And as the name might suggest, um, it doesn't have to be touching the surface. Now, these generally include um, various light systems or laser systems. Um, there are a variety of different kinds. There are blue light systems. There are white light systems. There are laser interferometers. Generally, for this uh, presentation, however, I'm just going to cover those which relate to articulated arm CMM, which um, include laser probes and, more specifically, laser line probes, which we abbreviate LLP. All right? So moving on, let's now talk about the single point repeatability and biometric accuracy. Um, because when you buy or when you're looking to buy a uh, articulated arm coordinate measuring machine, um, they're going to be spec using these two different numbers. And you might be wondering, well, what's the difference? You know, what, what, what do I care about? And I want to call out really the difference then. Um, this boils down to the difference between precision and accuracy. Um, so simply stated, symbols single point repeatability or precision is how close the same measurements are together, while volumetric accuracy is how close a point can be in 3D to the correct position. 
But now you can have situations, a variety of different situations, because these two are somewhat independent. And um, we have a graphic here on the screen that's going to help me um, talk about the differences. And so we're going to start with the situation presented with the top left uh, bullseye there. And you, you see it is a bullseye, and uh, we have some, uh, some marks that kind of represent, for this uh, example, we can represent shot. And um, they're trying to hit the bullseye, um, but in this case, they were pretty far away from the center of the target. Another thing you'll notice is that those four separate black dots are not close together. So in this situation, because they're not close together, they're not precise. But because they're not far away from the center of the, the bullseye, they're not accurate either. So that's, that's the situation. So moving on, if we move over um, in this row, so we move over to the top right now, you'll notice that this shot grouping is a little bit different. The points are still not spaced together, which would imply no precision, but however, they are centered around the center of the bullseye, which gives us a, a degree of accuracy. So we can say that these points have some accuracy, but no precision. Moving on. Now, if we go to the bottom left, we have a tight grouping of shots that is at some distance from the bullseye. This grouping um, is very tight, however, um, while being far from the bullseye, which would imply that it has a very high precision value, but a very low accuracy. And finally, the last um, case we're going to be presented with is the ideal case, where you're both accurate and precise. You see a very tight shot grouping, and they are all on the bullseye. So when you see things like single point repeatability and they give a number, and you see volumetric accuracy and you're given a number, this is what those two numbers are representing. How, how much, how precise the machine is and how accurate the machine is. And those two numbers are generally different. Now that you know the difference between those two, we'll go ahead and move on. So the next thing we're going to talk about is the, the first of the core presentation. And we're going to go ahead and get into contact measurement now and kind of analyze the different contact measurement solutions we have. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this is going to include heart probing and touch trigger probing. All right. So heart probing is a subset of contact measurement that requires um, after you've made contact of the probe with the part, it requires a manual trigger. So what, that, what I mean by that is generally there's a button or a trigger or even voice command. It can be done a variety of different ways depending on uh, the equipment you have bought and the software that goes works with it. But generally, you're going to place the probe against a surface and you're going to press a button, and that's going to take a point. And now these probes that are associated with hard probes are generally the simplest. They do not have moving parts. They are not electronic. They are uh, a simple known geometry that is then used to uh, take points. Um, they come in a variety of different um, sizes and geometries, though. Um, the two biggest distinctions are going to be ball-type probes and then needlepoint probes. Um, ball-type probes um, are what they sound like. It's a, a spherical ball mounted on the end of a stem. The ball is of a known diameter, and it's generally made of Either um, you have some made out of steel, you have some uh, made out of ceramic, and you also have some made out of uh, ruby and different materials, um, depending on the parts you're measuring and the size you need to be able to measure. Um, and then the point probe um, is simply a stem that ends in a needle point, and this allows um, this allows for much smaller measurements to be taken. All right. Calibration. So when we talk about any type of probing and we're going to compare them, we first have to also compare how these probes are set up. And this process is known as calibration. So on, of the largest variety of modern day coordinate measuring machines, especially the articulated arm type, um, the probes are interchangeable. You can switch them out. However, when you do that, it's necessary then to teach the arm the new geometry. So we need to teach it where that, that tip is, where it's going to be taking measurements. And that's this process. This is known as calibration. Um, now, for this, for this video, uh, for the sake of time, we're not going to go into these calibration too much um, because um, there are very helpful videos. I have included a link here, um, www.ferro.com slash site slash resources slash support videos. And if you want to navigate here, we have videos on um, multiple different types of the calibrations you use, um, depending on the type of uh, probe you're using. So a ball probe would use pole compensation. 
while a point probe would use sphere compensation. And you can check those out at any time by navigating to that site. One of the things that we want to talk about, and maybe the biggest distinction between a ball probe and a point probe, other than just the size and what you're able to reach down into, is this concept called compensation. So when you have a ball probe, um, and we've done the calibration process from the previous slide that we discussed, um, what you're going to teach the arm, and if you look at my graphic here, this is what I'll be referencing, the, the point there labeled with the number three is the center of the ball. That center is what we taught the arm when we did the calibration process. The arm now knows where that center is. However, with a ball probe, anytime you make a measurement, you're contacting the surface labeled with the two. So the contact is at the edge, and the known point is at the center. This gives us some distance given by the number four that needs to be accounted for, and this is the radius of the probe. So generally, um, when, you, when you set up a probe with your software, you're going to tell it the probe's radius so that the software can account for that. Um, this just requires an extra computation, um, and, gen and, and depending on the software you're using, it can be built into the normal steps. Um, but generally, a point probe is going to have the location labeled as the number two, and the location labeled as the number three, as the same thing, because the point will take measurements where it's contacting the surface. And this is just a key difference between point and ball probes. All right, well, let's now talk about ball, uh, hard probe accuracy. Um, and this is a big uh, thing, a uh, big benefit for hard probing. Because it's generally the simplest kind of probe, um, as I mentioned, there are no moving parts, there are no electronics, um, you're not going to add any inaccuracy to the arm. It's going to and completely rely on whatever machine you're using, the accuracy and the precision stated for that device. So this, of the methods we'll talk about today, this is generally one of the most accurate methods, hard probes. It's the simplest, and it requires um, the manual trigger, but it is one of the more accurate ones. Uh, modern arms, as I have displayed here on the screen, they range from less than a, less than a thou, um, a thou meaning a thousandth of an inch, to um, about five. You can see them as high as ten. Generally, the accuracy of an arm is related to the length of the arm and uh, the manufacturer, as well as a uh, variety of different reasons. So now that we've learned how to uh, calibrate a hard probe and we've talked about the difference between point probes and ball probes, we should talk about how you capture data with a hard probe. Um, and so there are two uh, general methods that you're going to be using, and uh, they are single point and interval. So like, like, like the name contact measurement suggests, we're going to place the probe up against the part, and then we're going to press the trigger. Um, with a single point method, you're going to just press the trigger every time you want to take a point. So in the uh, graphic I have on the screen in the picture, uh, the top there, single point, you can see that there are six points total given by those probes with the green balls. Now every time um, you wanted to take one of those points, that would require six separate clicks of the trigger or the button or whatever command you're using to take a point. Now with the interval method, um, you can set it to uh, basically a distance or a time-based interval. A distance-based interval is going to be where you set a, you specify a distance and then you hold down the trigger. And then every distance you move while in contact with your surface, it's going to record a reading. Um, the time works very similarly, except that instead of specifying a distance, you put in a time. And then as you're holding down the button, um, it's going to take points. So those are the two methods that we're going to use. Um, where would you use one over the other? Um, generally, single point can be um, very quick and easy if you're doing um, a few number of points to specify something on your part. But if you want to use a hard probe to take a moderately high um, number of points, the interval method is going to be what you want to go with, because you can take a higher number of points more quickly, more efficiently, than just using the single point method, not having to click the trigger every time. Now, when we're taking points, um, how is the hard probing going to use those points for an inspection? Um, and 
generally, and uh, the way that uh, Pharaoh's CAM2 measure 10 software works, is it is a geometry-based inspection. So what we're going to do is we're going to specify on our part basic geometric primitives or basic geometries. We have a couple of these listed in the chart on the screen in the column that's all the way to the left. You can see there plane, line, circle, sphere, cylinder, and cone. Now, each of these features, each of these geometries that we're trying to find on our part have a, a minimum number that's defined by mathematics for definition. This is given by the middle column. So like, for example, you can see there there's plane. If we follow over to the middle column, we see that it takes an, a minimum number of three points to make that plane. Now generally though, if you're doing an inspection on that plane, we're going to need to take more than three because three points is always going to feed us a perfect plane. That's the minimum number to define it, and it won't be wrong at all. And we know, all know in inspection and design that it's very hard to get something that's even close to perfect from a machining process. So generally when we're doing an inspection, which is the whole point, we want to capture more points. We want to capture points so that we actually get a representation of our part, not a, not a perfect version. Um, and so Farrell came up with a uh, way to come up with um, the number of points you should be taking. And that's shown by the column all the way to the right. For example, with the plane, as I mentioned before, we recommend taking at least seven points. You can, of course, take more. Now, once you take the right number of points, what's the software going to do? Well, the software is going to best fit that geometry to those readings you just taken. So for the example of the plane, I'm going to return to it. We've taken seven points, a minimum of seven points for our plane. So now the software is going to take the plane and it's going to best fit it to those seven points. Um, this works for majority of location, um, even some um, some low form. But in, in, inherently in this method, um, you'll see that the software is accounting um, for a lot of data that's missing, right? We've taken seven points on our surface. What about all the surface that falls in between those seven points? That's just being accounted for by a, um, by a best fit. Now, this works very well for, for formed machine parts, um, but if, if, a, if a formed part um, needs a very high surface inspection, um, we need to take a lot of points. Um, depending on the action required, the, the number of points needed can, can get up into the thousands even. Um, and so that's kind of a fallback, um, or a, sorry, a, a downside of, um, of hard probing, and that it can be hard to take a very high volume of points. Um, even using one of the scan modes earlier, um, it can still take a while to get up into the thousands or even um, hundreds, above 100,000 points. And that's going to be one of, uh, going to be something that we'll probably talk about a little bit later when we get to uh, the non-contact measurements. All right, well, let's go ahead and review hard probing then. So we discussed that hard probing, because it's a, it is a simple um, uh, geometry probe, um, it does not have moving or electrical components, and it requires a manual trigger from the user. Um, it's generally accurate. It does not add any inaccuracy to your system, so you'll be using the accuracy of the arm. So if the methods we'll talk about today, it is the most accurate method, and um, you can find um, articulated arm CMM on the market with accuracy and precision down to half a thousandth of an inch. Another thing um, about hard probing in conclusion, um, and this is probably more of a downside, is that it does take low volume of points. Um, so if a high volume of points is needed to coat a surface, generally um, hard probing is going to take more time to do that. Um, now, this can also be seen as a positive, because if the parts are machined and well-formed, um, a quick measurement of a geometric primitive that we talked about earlier, so those bores, those planes, edges, um, is going to suffice. And that's going to be a quick um, inspection. It'll be easy. And hard probing is the way to go for that. All right. Now, um, we're going to go ahead and briefly talk about touch trigger probes. Um, not going to spend too much time on this, because a touch trigger probe works very similarly to a hard probe. There's only one key difference. Uh, and this key difference is that there is no manual trigger anymore. So uh, the way a touch trigger probe works is they're generally more complicated probes and they're a little bit more expensive. Um, they have 
and internals which allow them to take a point automatically upon contact. So if you contact the surface, it'll just the, the probe will take a point on its own without any input from the user other than the contact. So this can be very beneficial for um, specific um, industries where a hard probe won't work. Um, I could bring up a couple of examples of molded or formed plastic. These parts have a very high yield. So if we were to touch them with a hard probe, we would actually be forming this, deforming this geometry and changing the shape of the part while trying to measure it, which is not really going to give us a good inspection. Uh, when you're using a touch trigger probe, however, the amount of pressure required for the touch trigger probe to take a point is actually less than is needed to bend um, most thin plastics. So it'll actually take the point before the probe bends the plastic and there will be a much more accurate measurement um, for either reverse engineering or inspection. And that concludes um, our section on contact measurement. Um, so we're going to go ahead and jump right into non-contact measurement. Remembering that for this presentation, non-contact measurement is going to include laser probes that attach to arms, namely laser line probes, which are abbreviated as LLP. So what is a laser line probe, or an LLP? And I have here a picture of a ferro edge uh, laser probe, um, which is labeled with the number one at the laser emitter. This laser emitter um, generates a laser beam or a line that rests on your part. This laser beam or line is then read by the camera labeled with the number two. And you notice that the camera is at an angle because it's going to use um, a triangle constructed to uh, generate the distance that the laser is from the emitter when it's, when it's actually contacting the surface. And this is how the inspection is made. So this handle here, this trigger system that I have, this LLP, is actually going to mount onto the end of an articulated arm's DMM right underneath where the harm probe sits. And now there are various different types of laser probes. This is just one example. And this example uses the calibrated, it uses a very specific type of calibration using the calibration plate labeled with the number three. So in this graphic, um, you can show the setup I just talked about. Um, we have an articulated arm CMM. It has a hard probe mounted. And then there's the laser probe that is mounted underneath where um, the, the man holding the uh, trigger in the picture is holding the trigger of the laser. Um, so as with a hard probe, however, whenever we attach a laser probe to an arm, we do need to calibrate. Uh, um, this is just another process that you need to go through. Um, and once again, videos for this process can be found at the same link as before at ferro.com. However, we should talk about now some laser line probe calibration considerations. So when calibrating a laser probe, um, it is actually first necessary to use a properly calibrated um, contact probe. So this can actually, um, this actually lengthens the calibration process by a little bit because you need to first calibrate a hard probe before you can even calibrate the laser probe. It's actually dependent upon a proper calibration. Um, another ca consideration I want you to be aware of um, is that an LLP, when it's using that triangulation method I discussed earlier, generally has an error of its own that's independent from an articulated arms error. And these two need to be added to give an error of the entire system. So um, with the example of the, the Faro um, Edge LLP that I talked about, that's going to add about a thou of, uh, of accuracy to your whole system, which then makes it a little bit less accurate than the hard probing that we talked about earlier. However, laser probes are excel at capturing high volumes of data. Um, the, shown, the one shown in the picture is the Edge LLP. And this takes between 45 and 48,000 points a second along that projected laser beam line that I talked about. And that laser beam line is between 3.5 to 4 inches wide. So when you're measuring with a laser probe, not only is it taking these 45,000 points per second, but you're measuring with a line and not a point. So when you sweep that line over your surface, you're kind of making a rectangle, which is taking up much more points over a wider area than a point probe can do, even with set to a distance or time interval. And that's really where um, the laser probe shines. And if you need to take 
high volumes of points, um, which can be useful for a variety of different reasons. Um, what you're going to get when you finish a scan is what we call a point cloud. So it's going to take those 48,000 points along that line, and you're going to have those all spread around your part. And this is called a point cloud because it doesn't actually recognize any geometry within itself. It's a series of points, and they correspond to whatever shape the part of that you scan. Um, now, we can do a lot with these point clouds that can be very useful for both reverse engineering and inspection. Um, a point cloud can be exported uh, to a CAD package where it can be then um, turned into a polygonal model or a surface model and uh, be used from, for reverse engineering or later inspection. Um, as an inspection tool, it can also be used a little bit differently. Um, this presumes that you already have a CAD model of your part. But what we can do is we can create a point cloud color contour map. So what is a point cloud color contour map? Well, you input your CAD model, and then you lay that point cloud I discussed on top of the CAD model. And software actually then can take that and compare the two of them, give you colors, a color gradient based on numbers of where your high points are, where your low points are, and where the, where the part is properly formed. This graphic on my screen is a great example of that. You can see there is a surface, and it's coated in a bunch of different colors. Each of those colors is actually a very dense set of points that is then just being referenced to the CAD model. Um, another thing I'd like to point out with this graphic, um, where a laser probe excels, is that with this part that we see on the screen, there's a lot of formed sections, curved sections that don't really correspond to any of those geometric primitives we discussed earlier like a plane or a circle. I can see some boards that would be pretty easily captured as a heart probe, but things like um, this center section here would be somewhat difficult to capture with a heart probe or this curved section right here. So what um, we're actually going to do, the laser probe captures those really well and compares those to the CAD model, giving you an inspection of something that would be very hard to inspect otherwise. All right, well now, um, in the presentation, we're going to take a, uh, a quick break from the presentation, and I'm actually going to go ahead and do uh, a live demonstration of a, um, of a scan and aligning that to a CAD model um, using a 9-foot ferrule edge arm and a ferrule edge laser line probe, which you have seen in the pictures. I will be also using um, Ferro's software, CAM2 Measure 10. Um, and we have, I have a part here in front of me, and I have a CAD model part already loaded in. So it looks like I am going to be showing my screen here. And uh, can I, I, think, uh, I think we're good now. So I'm showing my screen. I see that uh, the audience view is good. So um, we'll go ahead and get started. So this is the software. This is what it looks like. Here's the CAD model of the part I will be standing in. And um, along the left side of the screen, you can see I already have a list of the different things I'm going to be doing for this demo already planned out. Um, so for the first step, I'm actually going to use a hard probe. Um, I'm going to go ahead and measure some features uh, so that I can align up to this, this uh, the CAD model. And then I'm going to go ahead and lay that, that scan on top of it. Um, everything I'm using has already been calibrated. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and jump right into it by hitting the play button. And uh, I'll uh, kind of narrate as I'm going along here. So this is what I want to measure. I'm going to go ahead and hit yes. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and measure the top surface of this part, shown as highlighted now in yellow on my screen. And I'm going to capture this with the heart probe. I'm going to be using single point method. So I have a trigger, and I'm going to press that every time I want to take a point. And if you go ahead and watch, this area right here, where it says top surface, that's going to count for me the number of points I'm taking. Remember, and I don't expect you to necessarily because you saw it for a small amount of time, from that chart, the number of points minimally defined from math for a plane is three. So I just measured three. But I'm going to go ahead and take the seven that Faro recommends here, and uh, we'll watch that form value increase. And form for a plane is flatness. So you can see now how this would be an inspection for this plane. We're actually looking at its flatness now as we're going. And once I hit seven points, I'm going to go ahead and finish this plane with a, uh, a form value of two thousandths of an inch and two tenths of a thousandth of an inch. All right, so now I'm going to go ahead and measure uh, the front edge. This is, a, this is a line. 
So I'm going to go ahead and take five points for this. This is just that, so it's that Farrell recommended number. Also using single point method, I'm just pushing a trigger every time I want to take a point, and it's counting upwards for me. I'm going to finish that off. That had a pretty good form value, very straight line uh, at about six tenths of a thousandth of an inch. Now finally, uh, to measure the large counterboard at the center of the screen, this one highlighted in yellow right now, I'm actually going to go ahead and set this to the distance interval I talked about. You can see that um, I can now set this distance, and you can see that it'll, um, it'll, it'll let me take points a little bit more quickly. I won't have to push the trigger every time I want to take a point. I can just kind of sweep around my part, and it'll take points every half inch that I move. So I'm now holding down the button and sweeping around, just taking points every half inch that I move through this board. And if I had set that to a very small number, um, it could take points fairly rapidly, not as rapidly as 45,000 a second, but um, give you some ability to scan high lines of points with a hard probe. So I'll go ahead and finish that. And now we'll begin the scanning portion of, uh, the, of this demo. So now that I'm all lined up, you can see my scanner is turned on, my laser is turned on, and I have a red beam showing on my part. Um, also, the part is going to rotate on the screen as I rotate my probe um, in real life. So it's going to follow that. And uh, I'll go ahead and start scanning now just by pressing the trigger. As I scan, you'll notice that the points are coming up with a color. And then these ones are all green, which is quite good, meaning that this section of the part matches up with the CAD model really well. Now, there are some definite uh, best practices with scanning. Um, you want to avoid what we call uh, scrubbing, which is if I were to pass over an area multiple times, kind of imagine scrubbing with like a scouring pad. You don't want to do that with a laser. Um, we like to compare laser scanning to painting, um, and you want nice, even brush strokes, nice, even scan. And you're just going to pass over the part, and you're going to start capturing different data, and, uh, and this is going to be a good comparison. You notice some of those points on that counterboard surface, Try to highlight it with my mouse here. Are a little bit um, more blue, like a turquoisey color. Um, this follows the gradient um, where points tend towards the blue side if they're getting low, and this whole surface is low. Um, this is a training part, and that was done intentionally. So I'm just going to keep going here, coding some of the part in uh, a surface of points. You guys can see the different numbers, um, the different colors. Sorry, not numbers. They'll correspond to numbers that we'll look at later. Um, so the ones on this side are, are trending a little bit more towards yellow. Um, that would be where they're getting a little bit high. Um, and so basically, you keep going until you've coded the part in a sufficient number of points per your inspection or your reverse engineering. Um, you could keep going until you scan the entire part. Um, however, um, for this demo, that might be a little bit too lengthy of a process. So I'm going to go ahead and finish this scan. Uh, you notice that I been doing, I've been talking for maybe they're scanning for about five minutes, maybe less, and I've already taken 64,000 uh, points over this uh, part. And I could, of course, keep going. It's a, it's a very fast method to take a very large number of points. In fact, these points are so densely grouped, they don't hardly even look like points. They look more like uh, lines. All right, so I'll go ahead and finish that out, and that's going to fall away. Let me go ahead and... Uh, hang my articulated arm CMM up here. All right, so now we can go look at this data. So you can see we have some surface scan data that's, uh, that's applied over the whole part here. Um, and we have uh, a lot of points. And if I zoom in, you can kind of see how they are points. There's just a ton of points all next to each other. Um, and so this is a really useful tool for inspection because now I know where the high points are on this section of the surface that I've scanned. And I know that this entire surface is maybe a little bit too low. I might want to bring that up. Um, the, uh, the colors correspond to the numbers given on this scale here along the side, along the right side. Um, so we can see the, this, this kind of blue color here on the, on the counterbore surface. They kind of correspond to, well, maybe negative point, uh, between negative point zero, three, three, and negative 0.043. So that's just going to be a tell of how well this part was machined.
These scans um, can also be really useful. Um, this is just one example. This is a color contour map. So this is more of a, an inspection tool than it is a reverse engineering tool. But the reverse engineering site works very similarly. Um, in fact, I would not have needed to import the CAD model at all. I would have just started with scanning. My points would not have these colors. Um, they wouldn't be green and blue. Um, we can see some red points. They would generally be just black. Um, but they would correspond to the part in three dimensions. And you could use those points to then make yourself a CAD model. So with that, um, the scanning demo is finished. Um, so I'm going to ask Leslie if we can uh, switch back to the presentation now. Okay. I'll just take a minute here. There we go. Yeah. No problem. Perfect. Okay. Awesome. All right, so now that we've talked about and I've shown how to do uh, a color contour map, I do want to talk about some of the considerations when doing a laser scan. So I'm going to go ahead and advance to the next slide. And there we go. Jumps ahead of me. All right, so some measurement considerations. Um, and let's talk about that. Now, part color can affect the scan. Uh, different colors absorb different frequencies of light, and laser is um, light. So generally, dark colors absorb more light, and they can be harder to scan. Now, um, this is not necessarily, um, uh, there is no real rule of thumb. You notice the part I, I just scanned in was black. Um, and the points coded on it were very thick, um, so it wasn't have any trouble reading that. However, the part I'm doing is a very matte black, um, and that kind of leads us into the next topic, which is reflectivity. Because that's more of a, um, of a hindrance when you're trying to do a laser scan than the color really is. So part, refle sorry, part reflectivity um, is really can scatter a laser and make it very hard to capture parts. Um, an example of this would be anything with a really very high machine finish. Um, of course, chrome parts are, are very shiny. Um, there are a variety of different solutions for these. Um, one can use um, painting, and one can also use, they make um, sprays. There are companies that make uh, different uh, coatings that you can coat a part with. They're very easy to clean off, and they don't change dimensions like painting might. Um, so there we can also see an image of, um, of a, a scan of a very shiny part. This part was coated in, um, in a spray that's, that's clear to us and then um, very easy to capture with the laser. So those are the solutions. Um, it can be a little bit of a time constraint you have to, you know, if you have to paint it or you have to uh, coat it in a spray. But if, if the laser is, is what you want to go with, and the part is very shiny, it is, it is the solution that you're going to need to use. All right. Well, we've talked now about non-contact. We've talked about contact. We've talked about hard probes, touch trigger probes, and, of course, the laser line probe. So now, how can you benefit? You know, which one works best where? Um, and so let's go ahead and discuss that for a little bit now. So, heart probing. As we discussed with heart probing, it is accurate. It is the most accurate of the methods that we've talked about. Um, it doesn't add any inaccuracy to your arm. And uh, it requires, uh, generally it requires a manual trigger to be taken to require a point. Now, heart probes work very well for doing feature-based inspections on machine parts. So any, any, uh, any welding shop, any fabrication shop, any machine shop, where you want to, where you want to capture diameters, where you want to capture distance from hole to hole, where you want to capture uh, circularity and flatness, um, maybe true position as well. If you guys are using geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, um, any of those applications are going to see a lot of use out of a hard probe, and it's going to be very useful. Um, where you want to get into um, things like touch trigger probing, for example. Um, Second here. There we go. 
touch sugar probing um, can be very similar. So let's say you want to, like the, uh, like the hard probe, you want to be able to inspect diameters and hold a whole location and the distance between the width of the part, the height of the part. Um, but the part is made out of a material that is bent easily. Um, the best example of this being plastics. Any type of form plastic that's thin, um, if I try to touch it with a, for example, um, quarter inch uh, steel ball pro, that plastic is going to bend. And trying to take a point on bending plastic and have used that for an inspection reverse engineering will not benefit um, will not benefit the user. So generally, um, you need to either use a tough trigger probe, so something that will take a point so quickly that it'll actually take the point before the part can bend, because we are still touching it, and the part will still bend. But uh, what's cool about touch trigger probes is they actually take the point, take the reading in its free state before it actually moves. Um, another one would be sheet metal. Um, if you have bent or formed sheet metal um, at a at like a 90 degree angle, for example, um, and you're trying to touch off on that, that's also going to bend. Some of these parts, these plastics and form sheet metal, can also be kind of hard to secure down. Um, we can't clamp them down so easily to a table, um, especially without deforming them, um, without moving them from their free state. And this can generally give us a bad inspection because we're not inspecting what it actually is. We're changing it and then trying to inspect it. It can be very hard. Um, so the the ideal solution then for anybody doing something maybe like plastic or something like that would, have, would then be the last method we of course talked about, which is laser line probes or uh, non-contact measurement solutions. Um, these are also ideal for a complete reverse engineering project. Um, point clouds, like I mentioned, can be exported into CAD models. These CAD models can be, um, to name a few of the popular ones, um, you'll have your IGIS, your STEP, and your Parasolid. Um, Parasolid uh, is the X underscore T listed on the uh, on the screen there, and uh, this can be very useful if you don't have a CAD model and you want a CAD model. Um, and uh, as the image there shows um, of the statue of the angel there, uh, that's a very complex geometry. Uh, there are no circles on that. There are no faces on that. Um, trying to capture that um, with a hard probe would be very lengthy, uh, incredibly lengthy. Uh, and incredibly difficult. Um, and a laser probe would be able to do it quite nicely, as is actually evident. Each of those colors there represented our different scans that were done on this part. Um, just a complete coating of very dense points that are covering this, this angel statue so that we could actually completely reverse engineer and, uh, and redesign for, I think, the, the purpose of this one was actually restoration. Um, so, so there are a variety of different um, uses for both of the methods. Um, and uh, during the Q&A session, if you have a specific question about your industry, please feel free to ask it. Um, these are just some generalities. Um, so I would uh, I'd like to again uh, thank everybody for listening to our webinar today. Uh, once again, my name is Ryan Dance, uh, Application Engineer with Faro Technologies. Uh, if you have any questions or would like to look at any of the things we talked about today, you can navigate to uh, in your web browser to www. Faro, that's F A R O dot com. And I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn it back over to, uh, to Leslie. Thank you, Ryan. That was an excellent presentation. And it was uh, very thorough with some of the information covered. If any of you have any questions, now is a good time to go ahead and bring them in. You can just type them on into uh, the question section. I think you'll see that on the GoToWebinar control panel to, to bring them in. But you spent a, a good portion of time on um, reverse engineering, Ryan. And I was kind of sure. curious how that might apply to, for example, 3D printed parts. Are there anything special there that you might want to use for either inspection or reverse engineering? Um, well, yeah, using Repoprom, you can actually take a, um, so let's say we have a part in front of us. Um, this part does not have uh, a CAD model for it. It's a formed part. Um, you can actually scan that part in using a laser probe. Uh, this is a reverse engineering application. And then you can feed that information to a, a, a 3D printer or a rapid prototyping machine. Um, and within a, a couple hours, they generally take a couple hours um, at least, uh, you mm -hmm. can actually have a, a plastic version of that part printed out. 
Um, this could be great for prototyping. I mean, as the name suggests, for prototyping. Um, I know that um, I, I, if I could give an example, um, Jay Leno um, yep. is, is restoring old cars from the 20s and the 30s. Um, a lot of those parts don't have any information, no prints, no CAD models. They're, they're from a very, they're from very long ago. Um, and he actually uses a laser probe to scan in those parts. And then wrap it, and then edit them uh, on the computer to to make changes, make um, improvements. They then rapid prototype that part, make sure it all fits, make sure it all works, and then send it off to a uh, a machine shop where they can machine it right away. So yes, that's a mm -hmm. very uh, that's a very useful uh, reverse engineering and prototyping uh, combination. As well as for some of those industries where, like you said, they don't have the CAD drawings anymore, and you. Right. They maybe have the part, and it's a great way to build your inventory of store drawings, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that you'll have that. Okay. Any other questions from anyone? If you have specific questions that you don't want to ask over here, you can email Ryan or call him. The information is on your screen. Or if you would prefer, you can also email me or give me a call, and uh, we'll make sure that Ryan or whomever at Faro needs to answer that question, we'll make sure that the question gets over to them as well. Yes, absolutely. Uh, very reachable. If you ever have any question about any of our, uh, any of our technology, uh, please feel free to ask. Um, yeah, that, my email's right there. Uh, that's also my uh, my. My phone number. Um, I, if you if you want to call, or you can even send in a text message. I only request that if you do send in a text message, um, do introduce yourself, uh, your name, your company, um, and then absolutely ask any question you like. Okay. Well, if there are no questions, I'd like to thank everyone again for attending. This webinar is has been recorded, and it will be sent out to everyone um, either tomorrow or in the next couple of days. So those people who registered this will be able to have access to it. It will also be posted up on the Design World online web, uh, website in the next couple of days. So if you want to take a chance to view it there, you can do so as well. And again, my thanks to Ryan and Farrow for putting on this webinar. Thank you, thank you everyone, for attending. Whoops. Oh, we got to thank you, Ryan, from, a, from someone who, who enjoyed it very much. So. I'm glad to uh, I'm glad to help. I'm glad to be informative. All righty. Thank you all for attending. Have a great Thank afternoon. You.